Hello. Today is April 3rd, 2012. We're meeting today with Mr. Daryl Bigut at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Daryl, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Well, thank you. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I was uh, born in Wisconsin in the uh, cold part of the year, December 5th. Ooh. <laughs> matter of fact, I was born on a sled, going to meet the doctor. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was 1934. And uh, you lived in a rural part of the state, uh, coming uh, northern part, northern part of the state, and uh, was dairy farm we had, and uh, I'm one of uh, fifteen kids. Really, and where, where do you fit in that order? Uh, middle. There's eleven older and or uh, eleven sisters and three brothers. Wow. As the oldest one is boy, and then there's six girls, then there was myself, then there's five girls, and two boys. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, uh, so you spent your youth growing up then on the farm there then? Right. Okay. And uh, went to the school system there and, yeah. and, and such? Yeah. yeah. What was... Uh, what was life like back in those days on the on the farm with that with that big of a family? Oh, it, you know, I thought it was really enjoyable. I really did. It was. I think we were really fortunate to have, uh, you know, that big a family because we'd have our own baseball team and whatever we wanted to do, and the things that we did. Uh, of course, we used to do uh, a lot of fishing, hunting, and and. Uh, Things like that, so it was it was great. I'll be darned. And then what uh, what year did you graduate from high school? I actually 1952. Okay. And what I did, I really I didn't actually graduate from it. I went back and got my uh, my uh, GED, and then got my from the school. So uh, then, I guess take your story then. From there, once you got out of school, or the step where you went from there. Yeah, well, we, after after uh, I left school, of course, me being the boy, middle of the bunch, and my older brother had left, so that left me with ninety percent of the farm work. Oh, geez, yeah. And I just got tired of it. And the same thing, it was another family that was as big as ours. And he looked at me and he said, let's go in the Air Force. Oh, really? <laughs> so there was actually four of us that went into the Air Force at the same time. Now, how come, with all the, uh, the different branches to choose from, how did you guys come to choose the Air Force? You know, I really don't... Well, for one thing I wanted to do was to fly. Oh, okay. I wanted to fly. And I thought, well, that'd be a good place. And uh, so that's where, where we uh, left from. Did, did the, the folks have any problems with you uh, joining? Or what was oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, matter of fact, my dad would not sign, because I was only 17. Oh, okay. And my dad would not sign the papers for me. And when I got up that morning, got ready to leave, they still weren't signed. And he came back just before I was ready to leave, and he signed the papers for me to go in. Huh. <laughs> Because I had, uh, what was it, six, eight, I think it was eight buddies from high school that went in, and they were all paratroopers, and every one of them were killed in the same jump. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah, everyone was killed in the same jump. So that was more of his reasoning behind that, behind signing, uh, as opposed to, to not leaving, uh, yeah. leaving the farm then? Yeah. Oh, it had, okay. It had to be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. Yeah, because the Korean War was in, in the thick of it when you, in 52, correct? Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So he had a change of heart, signed the papers, and then... And then yeah, you know, of course, I'm being as young as I was, it didn't bother me. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so then I went in, and, and we went to our basic at San Antonio. All, all of you guys together, your buddies? Yeah. Okay. Well, we weren't in the same group, though, right? Okay. different flats. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And uh, from there then, after we had, 
were there and notified us that we, I qualified for uh, gunnery school. So then I went into the gunnery and got my... Well, let me, let me back up uh, when you guys left for basic training. I mean, I, I imagine growing up, you probably hadn't traveled too far away from the farm. Uh, hadn't been away from the family. Now you're clear down in the southern part of the country, away from home. How was that transition for you? How was it the transition going, one, from civilian life into military life, and two, the transition of being away from home? Was there any sort of tinge of hope sickness or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh, oh, I remember... I do remember that down in San Antonio. When I got down there and, and uh, seen how rough these guys were, and the way they talked to us, and well, I'll give you an example. We were out marching one day, and I just, early morning, I just turned over to the guy to the uh, left side of me, and next thing the instructor was there, and he hauled off and clobbered me one, and said, we don't turn around, we look straight. And I, I thought at that point, what did I get into? <laughs> but uh, no, it worked out real good, though. Do you think you had uh, somewhat of an edge uh, being a country farm boy as opposed to like a city boy? Do you think you're... Oh, I definitely, I definitely do because yeah. of, uh, I still, you know, there was a lot more discipline, to, discipline on the, uh, for us farm boys, I think, than... than yeah, what probably a little bit more in better physical shape, yeah. I think, too, yeah. as well. Right. And, and how was it, I mean, going from a, a northern cold state to... The southern, I mean, an entirely different environment. That must have been kind of strange for you as well, I would think. Uh, or yeah, well, well, we got in there in, in uh, June, so it was very, you know, hot. And I came back to, let's see, we got a basic in August, I believe it was, and then we flew to Denver. Of course, you know what Colorado weather is like. <laughs> yeah. And it was cold that winter down there. Now, uh, you said you were... Uh, we're going off to gunnery school. Is that something you applied for or had uh, tested for, or how did you get into gunnery school? Tested. Okay. You got, uh, I'm not certain what they call those scores anymore, but you, certain score would qualify you to go in there. Okay. Something like that. Okay. And that's what I was chosen for, which I was really happy at that time, because there were a lot of them went to cooks and uh, mechanics oh, right. yeah. and... Yeah. So it was, you came up to Denver then for, for gunnery school then? Mm -hmm. And take your story from there. Yeah, went through gunnery uh, school. We were trained on uh, B-29s, mm -hmm. is what I flew out of wow. Denver. And also B-50 I was on. And I forget how long that school was. Seems to me it was about six months the school was. Because we didn't know what, everything about... Uh, uh, the aircraft, uh, weaponry, and whatnot, all. But it was it was interesting. Mm -hmm. And then and then where from there after after you finished gunnery school? After gunnery school, then we stayed in Denver for. Uh, oh, it was I'm trying to think. It was quite a while, and then then we got orders to go to Korea. Now, when you went, when you left for Korea, were you in a crew at this point, or were you going over as a replacement, or what? No, uh, it, it was all replacements. Okay. Like those those guys that were there were time for them to go back home, and then we were going in to replace them. Okay. Okay. And then from there we went to uh, San Francisco, boarded a big troop ship. Uh, and that that begs the question: Here's this uh, Wisconsin farm boy going to sit going to sea. How was that for you? Did you get your sea legs, or talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I I had real good. Uh, really didn't bother me. I'm, a lot of them were sick all the time, but I never was. Of course, I love to eat. And come to find out later, as long as you eat, you're not going to get sick. Oh, okay. Same thing flying. There was uh, uh, another guy from Connecticut, and him and I, of course, every time we went on a flight out of Denver, it usually was 12, 14 hour flights. Jeez. So they all had box lunches with us. Well, everybody gets sick when they eat their box lunch. So Skip would look at me and he said, "There, we got an extra lunch." <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, it didn't it didn't bother me. But we spent uh, thirteen days on the boat going over. What did you do to pass the time during that? For those? Just 
go up and uh, stand on the deck and watch the ocean go by and uh, see the uh, the uh, flying fish and what all that would come out of the water and and uh, then we played a lot of cards but uh, there was a couple of times we had really 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 rough seas that yeah. they were concerned about the, our captain was and they uh, all of us had to go down and then they closed all the hatches because water was just going over the top of the ship. Oh geez, oh wow. Yeah. wow. So 13 days then did you go uh, to Japan or on straight Japan. Japan. Okay. Yokohama. I went into Yokohama and uh, I was fascinated going over is because you uh, crossed the international date line. Yeah. So you spend like let's say it was the uh, 6th of March you had two days of the six, yeah, yeah. so you had actually forty-eight hours of this of that same day. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was it, and I still have my little card someplace here. I think it's in, okay. safe in my record. Oh right, okay. Yeah. Of uh, crossing the international date line. Yeah. So you land in, in Japan and go from there. We landed in Japan, and uh, I don't think we were there but a very, very short time, and then we flew from there into uh, Korea. Okay. And that was my first time that I really, is because when they briefed us going in, it said that we fly in with no lights, and uh, because of uh, anybody picking us up and that, especially that we were on a, a aircraft carrying, you know, a bunch of us troops yeah, going yeah. in there. So that was to me that was one of the, one of the scariest things that I thought there was. So so that was really kind of the first. I mean, I've talked to a lot of guys that as they pass under the Golden Gate Bridge, they start wondering about what I'm going getting into. And <laughs> you had 13 days of really not a whole lot to do, but to think. Yeah. But it was really the the plane trip that really finally. Uh, the, yeah, the, the plane trip when I, when we uh, left Japan to fly to Korea, that was when I really really start thinking about. Oh, geez, wow. Yeah. Huh. But still, you know, we didn't uh, being as young as I am, yeah, or was it? You're invincible that, yeah, yeah, at that age. That's, that's yeah. really, yeah, didn't really bother that much. But it made you really think about it. Yeah. Now, did you go fly directly into the base you were going to serve from, or into? No, we flew directly into the base. And which K were you? Uh, I was base? at K eight, Kunsan. That's that's where we had flew, and then from there I went to, from there I went immediately to. Uh, Busan, which was K6, was it? Anyhow, Busan is where I went into to do my survival training. Which, when you talk survival training, what what's that? Oh, describe that. Oh, that was that was two weeks of pure miserable. Yeah, we had they would take us out and in an enclosed weapons carrier and give you a map and a compass and tell you where you're that you're right here on the map and it's you we're going to drop you off and you have to find your way back wow. so this was to prepare you in case you were shot down over yeah, uh, yeah. okay yeah and, uh, <laughs> and they they put uh you went two by twos in it and i don't know it took us a couple days to find a way out of it and uh, one time we and they cautioned us about crossing the roads because of jeeps on them and he said you gotta make sure that you time yourself perfect well here it is pitch black and we I went across the road and next thing you know it was a deep embankment so I went down and, and I rolled in well next thing you know there's a guy with a gun over me and said I have you so uh, took me, blindfolded me, took me back to some compound they had and interviewed me, stripped me, totally stripped me. <laughs> wow. And they had always cautioned us about carrying stuff with you that would give them the, the enemy an option of uh, how to interrogate you and what to do. Well, 
she was my fiance. We, we decided not to get married until I come back. Yeah. So she gave me her little Loveland class pin that she had. And I carried that with me. Well, then when they went through my stuff, they found her picture and the name Loveland, Colorado on. Well, they kept asking me, where were you, where were you born? And I would tell them, Wisconsin. And they said, no, you're lying because you're Colorado. And I won't tell you then what they had like the picture I had of her, of the names that they would call her and uh, say things about her and that. And I just, you know, I just remembered what we were taught in our briefings and stuff before we left. But that went on for two, three days. And then that one time when they had us in, they had a guy sitting like I was here and he was over there and they had a real bright light in my face and I could not see him. And he had an accent. And let me tell you, by the time they were through with me, they totally had me convinced that I was captured. Wow. Huh. They totally had me convinced. And then he said, uh, blindfold him, and he said, take him out and uh, shoot him. <laughs> and, and I just, I knew, well, that, that, that was it. So uh, they blindfolded me and took me out and stuck me up uh, what I must have been a bank. And then I heard this go boom, 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 fired some rounds in it. And I, honestly, I thought that I was dropping. <laughs> wow. I was, I was so scared. And then we, then they took me back. From there, we went back to a compound, where there was, uh, I think there was 30, 30 of us in there, officers that were going through it and uh, the enlisted people mm -hmm. that. And there was three of the officers that were sent back to the states because they couldn't take it. Hmm. But I made it through the course real good. Uh, matter of fact, I was honored in uh, at graduation of it because of the way I handled myself. Really? Did not tell, only told what I was supposed to tell. Yeah, I was. I got the top honors for it. Wow. Was there any any point during that time you you thought you were going to break? I mean, or did you feel strong? Or? Uh, no, I did. I felt strong. I really did. I, uh, hmm. Wow. We done that, and then we went back to our base in, in K-8, Kunsan, and that's where we flew our flights out of. So now, it was it Kunsan then at K-8 that you finally linked up into? Were you ever in a, in a, in a, a, a flying group or a, a, a crew, or, or were you just constantly moving around to different crews? Or No, we were, we were uh, basically signed to... Uh, to a crew, okay. like the guy, my, I remember my pilot, Lieutenant Peters, and, okay. Okay. and uh, Tommy, our crew chief, and uh, no, we were assigned to a crew, but I'd never seen a B-26 before. Oh, I so got, you were put onto a B-26 then? Yeah, I, okay. I got onto a B-26 in Korea, and our first flight, well, I got to back up a little bit here. Yeah. When I got into Korea, we landed in Korea, about midnight it was. And I asked, I said, where was, where is the restrooms? So, uh, showed me and here it is dark and they give you, they gave the flashlight that had a, the red lens in it. So we, I went over there to the restroom and, uh, was in there and all of a sudden it bam I mean it went off like a gun boy I tore out of there and, and I went back over to barracks and next morning I went back over there well here it is what they had was like a big 55 gallon drum that would fill up on one end and then it would tip and flush well when it tipped it hit that metal bar <laughs> And I thought I had it that night. <laughs> that was something else. <laughs> uh. 
Yeah, then, like I say, then we were... Well, then a, a B-26 is considerably smaller than, like, a B-29. Oh, yeah, it was a different yeah, configuration. Yeah. Where did, where did it, and a smaller crew, too. Yeah, there was yeah. only the pilot, the navigator, and the gunner. Yeah. And so you sat down in the in the win, in the uh, no, front window in the back. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll have a picture okay. Here okay. 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 Good. Okay. You. No, I sat in the uh, back. That's where the gunner's compartment was. Oh, okay. Look, look, you sat here, and then you had the navigator and the pilot up here. Okay. Okay. They were probably well, the width of the Bombay or plus away from you is what they were. But how soon after you got settled in did you did you start running missions? Oh, we run right away. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We we uh, as soon as they as soon as they signed us our, our flight our crew, then we were we were uh, in the air. Now, uh, in the case of, uh, of your situation, were, were you? Was it a matter of a uh, a certain length of stint or a number of uh, missions you had to go on before you? Rotated out or no? You you had a twelve twelve month twelve month combat tour you had to put in, and it, regardless of how many missions you flew, how many it, missions you flew? Okay. okay, it was a twelve month uh, uh, tour that you had to put in combat. Well, when I got there and the war ended shortly, then so it was I was in Korea. I don't know was it six seven months something like that, and of course. You were given twelve. You were given uh, credit then if in Korea for the full year would have been twelve months. But if you were in combat, then you had to pick up the other months wherever they sent you. Ah, okay, okay. So then I went to after I think about seven months in Korea. After that, then we uh, went to our outfit was moved to Japan, and then I got extended. I was on my lap. We used to make a ladder. To see, uh, so we could tell Mark off when we were going home. Uh -huh. Well, when I got to Japan, in my ladder it went the other direction. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I still had to go up, get more yet, and then come down. <laughs> no. Well, now how uh, how long were you in, in Korea before the war ended? Well, I mean, I guess roughly roughly when did you arrive in Korea, and then and then when did the war end? Uh, I'm trying to think when it was that we got in there. I was probably in there, probably in there six, seven months before. Oh, oh okay. Not, not in the full length of that. There probably was a couple months that was, if I remember right, that was, uh, it was still going on. That, uh, and then from then on, then we had all mop-up operations mm. that we still had to fly and would and go on bombing runs. Oh really? Still, still, oh, yeah. still doing bombing runs even after the armistice was signed. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. really? Yeah, no, it was still because there was a lot. There was still a lot going on after that, and it 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 didn't fully end for, you know, for four, five, six, seven months afterwards. Really? Oh, interesting. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Roughly, how many missions do you do you remember? How many missions you ran? Oh, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't. Do any of those missions really stick out in your mind at all? You know, the only one that I can remember was the time when we were flying in, uh, I called up front and asked the pilot, I said, I, I didn't realize that we have F-86s escorting us. And he called back and he said, immediately and he said, uh, those are Russian MiGs. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, immediately then, you know, we put our, I throw on my, all my switches then to, uh, uh, my guns, so they'd be ready, and and it was it was so strange because it was just like a snap of the finger. We had F eighty sixes surrounded us. Wow! And uh, and I remember Pete saying, he said that that took care of those megs. He said they're heading out. Wow! Oh wow, man! Uh, so you controlled all the guns on the on the on the plane? On the, in my compartment. Okay. Where the pilot if, if get a. Uh, gunship, you know, with the wing guns and, and uh, those guns, and it was up to him that he controlled uh, the guns up front. What was the, what was life like or conditions like on on a, a B twenty six? Uh, well, it's where I sat in the back was uh, probably was no further from say if I'm sitting straight in here, 
I probably had 12 inches, 14 inches on each side I of me. Oh, is that right? It was now? just enough for me to turn my turret around that I could turn 360 degrees and watch, you know, from behind there. And, uh, yeah, that was, oh, you were all lonely by yourself yeah, there. Yeah. And, I mean, it, when there would be, oh, like in wintertime, I don't remember too much of that either. But Carl was saying, he said, don't you remember how we used to freeze? And I said, no, I don't. Yeah, because they weren't pressurized. Oh, no, yeah, no. Yeah. all it was was just the old uh, aluminum skin. There was nothing in them except that. Because you look on the side of the aircraft, it was just all the cables running, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, for the ailerons and, right, and right. Uh, elevating everything that was all uh, right there by us. And so, did you wear uh, electric heated uniforms or anything like no, that? No, no, just no, whatever you just, just layers just the ins insulated suit that we had, and that was it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and on average, how long would a mission last? Oh, we'd be up. Uh, it, it would depend again. I'd say the. Probably the shortest one that anybody would have ever flown. Probably would have been about two and a half hours. Okay. Otherwise, they were roughly four to five hours. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm. Well, talk a little bit about uh, life on the base. What was your living conditions like? Uh, the food? Uh, what you guys do for entertainment? Just generally, life when you weren't on. I mean, just talk about life on on the base there. There wasn't uh, really nothing on the base for us. Uh, food, of course, like I always said, if you like green eggs. Because all everything was dehydrated. Yeah, I never, I never seen the real piece of meat until I got to Japan. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and uh, powdered milk. We did have fresh bread, fresh bread and butter. We did have that. Well, I tell you, it, it must have been hard for particularly a farm boy where everything you were used to fresh food yeah. to have the, all this yeah. powdered. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was that was a switch. Yeah, <laughs> had that. Uh, you know, powdered eggs, I call them the green eggs. <laughs> but, uh, nah, it, it really wasn't that. And what was uh, uh, your living accommodations like? Oh, uh, living accommodations were just one big room with the four walls and all bunks. A, so, a tent or a quonset or what did... Uh, uh, they're quonset, I believe, is what they call them. I'll show you a picture of that uh -huh. here. Yeah, Quonset, I believe, is what they call them. Was it, uh, I know, you know, the Korean weather can be pretty rough. Is yeah. it, were you comfortable oh, were, against that? I mean. Oh, yeah, they just had that one, you know, one stove in it, and that was it. They heated it. Huh. But that was uh, comfortable yeah. enough for you there? Or, yeah. 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 And what about uh, when you weren't on duty or off duty? What, what would you guys do to pass time? I think most of it was reading, because there wasn't, or playing cards. I know we played an awful, awful lot of cards. Did you? Yeah. 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 If yeah. we weren't. Would you ever get, uh, did you have much interaction with the Korean people? Did you ever go around the base, or were you just pretty much stuck on base? Oh, we were stuck on base. Oh, okay. We couldn't go off the base. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. we had Koreans that were there, uh, worked in the mess halls that served us in that. Yeah. yeah. We, had, we had Koreans there. And, and what's, you know, let's talk a little bit about communications. I mean, in today's age, we've got the cell phone and internet that's instant. Uh, talk about the, about communications back home to those that uh, watch this. What what it was like for you? How did you communicate back and forth to home? Oh, just wrote letter. Yeah, yeah. There was you know there was no no other options. No. Yeah. Uh -uh. And how long would it take between letters to to get a letter back and forth? Oh. I think it, a lot of time it depends. It was uh, could be a week, two weeks yeah. to get back. And we had one ship that was mail ship that was coming over and had some other stuff, cargo ship, and they had to dump a bunch of mail and stuff in the ocean. And uh, there was oh, there was a pretty good period that one time, and we never got anything. Wow. I mean, that, it, it, like I said, in today's age, that is so foreign. A week or two weeks, you know, when it, now it's a matter of seconds to, to yeah. communicate with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I have a granddaughter that's stationed in Germany now in the Air Force. And uh, it just slays me when she calls because yeah. she sounds like she's sitting right here with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. 
Uh, so, and what about about uh, what about information news and and what was going on in the world? Ball scores or sports scores. We or, did. Well, how did you get that kind of information? That, they published a paper on the base, and that would be in it. But that's all we had. Hmm. Yeah, there was nothing else. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a uh, couple of interesting flights. I we were selected one time that the crew and I to go to uh, reconnaissance. So we flew up in towards, into Russia. Really? Oh, geez. That was interesting. And it was totally, we had different radio, and it was just between the crew, you know, people up front, me in the back. And what we did when we got into the ter enemy territory, which I called it, then it was strictly by push button that we had light. And like if he would call or he'd push back one time and to let see if I was okay, then I'd just push three times on the button. So it was complete so radio it silence. Was complete radio silence. Wow. Geez. And we could listen to them. I couldn't understand what they were saying. Yeah. But the uh, guy I was with was uh, uh, was a captain, and he spoke several different languages. And I happened to be with him that day that we got selected. And uh, then later on, he would relate back to us of what they were saying. They could they could tell what type of aircraft, but they knew that it was a slower moving aircraft, and the, and their radar was not accurate by any means, because like they had us at uh, whatever altitude it was. <coughs> Excuse me, and we were at another one. And uh, they were off about 3,000 feet when mm. they scrambled planes up. And we stayed in the clouds going to, you know, where we were or whatever. Because we had a ship that had uh, a camera in it, a photo ship, which uh, we would take and go and fly over. I had two, I had two uh, missions that I went that were into... And like we flew off the coast of Red China one time. Wow, jeez. What, what? I thought it was funny. I thought it was fun. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did really. I was real honored that you know to get selected to go. Yeah, with sure. The, yeah, with the crew in there. So. Yeah, I, I guess uh, you know for somebody that's never been in a, in a war situation or in danger like that, I, I, I often wonder what it was like. You know. Laying in bed before your your mission, if you're thinking about it, and then you're on the mission. I imagine in the, during the mission you probably got adrenaline going, so you're not really thinking about it. But and then getting back from the mission and having time to decompress about that, you know, I just yeah. what goes through a, no. man, a person's mind when he goes into harm's way, really, is no, what you're in. No, Every, really, because we used to joke a lot. Really, know, yeah. you know, if, uh, if we knew where we we're going, and somebody would say, talk about, well, what are you going to do with your footlock here, with your stuff? As well, don't come back. Take, there's some pictures in there you send to which Bernice and my fiance and, and the rest of you guys can divide up. <laughs> wow. So I mean, you, this is you just kind of diffused everything with humor yeah, then, huh? Right. Uh, uh -huh. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. During that time you were over there, did you ever have a chance to get away for R&R, &R, either to Seoul or back to Japan at all? Or I did the one time to uh, Japan that we flew. Yeah, that, was, that was a story. We took, we, every now and then those plates have to be weight and balanced. So they would put big lead bars, probably 16 inches long, three or four inches wide, if I remember right, about an inch or so thick. Well, I got in ready to take off, and it was hot. And here's all them lead bars. Well, I couldn't even move in there, so I took it, and we had a hole in the back of the, uh, I went into the tail section. So I took these lead bars, almost all of them, and I stuck them back in the tail section. <laughs> in the process of doing that, of course, it was so warm, so I left my upper hatch open, and that stood up, you know, about that angle. So uh, we uh, took off. We 
and just just got up and I don't know, maybe three, four hundred feet. And, and Pete said, we're going to have to try to go back. He said, something's wrong here. He said, I can't level. He said, we're keep climbing. So I could feel the air then. I looked up and I said, Pete, I got my hatch open. Oh, he says, close that thing. So all I pressure I could put on there to release the latch and let it close. Well, then it still wasn't right. So I have to think, oh, I got the mid bars, and I bet you that's what it is. <laughs> so I dug them all out quick and put them back alongside of me, some up the front close to the bomb bay, and we were okay then go. <laughs> but that was kind of neat, because on the wound went on R&R. &R. Yeah. I suppose they must have gave the pilots uh, money, because the pilots would always give us whatever we wanted. Oh, really, yeah? And got to Japan, whatever we wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that must have been interesting. I, I keep going back to this Wisconsin farm boy. You know, you're halfway around the world in these exotic lands. Yeah. It must have been yeah. exciting to, to be there. Yeah, it yeah. was. It, yeah. re it really, it was uh, really something to see. You know, I I think think now the the uh, flying, I just was reading a book from uh, one of the uh, army guys that were on the ground that went through it. And it was so interesting because of the things that he pointed out, like some of the rivers that we flew down real low, some of the areas that we hit, and that he's described in there. It's, it's just right? so fascinating yeah. wow. to me, yeah. So when you guys were going on missions, it, these weren't high-level bombing. These oh, were, no, you were no. flying down low then. Yeah, huh? this, see, the, uh, the B-26 was night, called the Night Intruder, and they were, most of all of them were low bombing, low bombing. That's when they, a lot of them, when they drop bombs to uh, get away from the blast, they immediately, as soon as the bombs left the bomb bay, they had to pull right back up that again. High, that low, huh? Yeah. Huh. Oh, there's times I've seen us come down the, the river where our props were, were picking up water. Really? Oh, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah, I've seen that. Wow. Matter of fact, my buddy and I were just talking about that the last time I seen him. It, huh. uh, yeah, they were dead. You you could see them when they would uh, pick up water and spray the side of the plane. Boy, you, you must have had a great view from your turret then. Uh, oh, from the site, yeah. 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 Huh. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, I guess moving ahead now, so uh, uh, you served your term there, and then you guys got transferred to Japan. Yeah. Take, tell, tell, take your story from there then. Well, we had, see, when we were in Korea, there was... No women on the base. There wasn't a woman on the base in Korea. And of course, then when we get to, to uh, Johnson Air Base, which was a base that carried a lot of the women, a lot of the women then, being said, we come from Korea, transferred them out of there. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 And I think the only thing that was left there were like uh, the nurses and uh, uh, somebody personnel that mm -hmm. in the Offices, etc. Yeah, right. But that was oh yeah, that was nice. We got uh, there. You know, of course, there we had the freedom. Then that when we had time off, that we could we could go and and probably better wanted. better conditions as well as far as the base I mentioned. A lot oh, nicer. oh, oh yeah. yeah, food. Oh, that was the first steak I had. Yeah, yeah, we got, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, that was I think that was one of the first meals they gave us when we landed. There was a steak. Mm -hmm. uh, and what was your purpose there? Once you're at that base, were you guys still flying missions anywhere, or, or what were you doing? Most of there, most of there. Then we did just uh, formation flying, and uh, like I'd, I'd call up uh, uh, Pete in the morning, say Sunday morning, say Pete, I want to fly over to uh, to uh, I want to fly around Mount Fuji. I want some pictures of it. Okay, he said, you, you got the plane gassed? And I said, yeah, I talked to the crew chief. He'll have it ready for us so we could go. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, we could go then. Wow. Or if, if we wanted to fly to another base to see somebody that was stationed someplace else, we were allowed to go. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, all we had to do is make sure when the plane came back that it was parked and serviced. Well, I guess that, that poses a question I forgot to ask, going back to Korea. When you go out on missions 
Were you were you flying in formations, or were you going out? Were solo missions, or how? No, how, how, most of it was. Well, there would have been uh, a lot of times you went by yourself, but a lot of there was you went more times, I should say, with three, four planes. Okay. Okay. That would go in, yeah. Okay. Because then one would go in, and then another would behind you, and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now your time's up. I guess your one year service time is up in Japan. Did you head home? Or, or, oh, but you yeah. got extended. Oh, I, I could talk about the extension. What happened? What was the story behind it? Well, I'm trying that? to think exactly. I ended up spending 20. I think I ended up spending 21, 22 months overseas. Oh, wow. Yeah, that I had to spend. So, uh, but it, it wasn't, you know, it was. Of course, just totally, totally different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to, uh, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to, you know, one one of these days, if I ever could, go back over to uh, Japan or Korea uh -huh. and just to see what was what. Yeah, right, right, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh. it, uh, no, it was a tremendous experience for a young man, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now you'd signed up for a, what a four year enlistment four, then? Four year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you got back uh, from overseas, uh, was that the end of your enlistment, or did no, you still have no, time? No, then I had had uh, another year to go, <clears throat> and I was shipped to Salina, Kansas, and which was a aerial refueling base at Smoky Hill Air Force mm -hmm. Base, and I wanted to go by back up. On flying back on the KC 97s. Well, by that time, of course, we were married because I got married right when I came back from overseas. Yeah, well, we need to uh, we need to back <laughs> up and, and I need to hear, hear the story about meeting this Loveland girl. How how that all came oh, together? When, yeah. When, uh, I tell you what, like we were just talking about this, and I said, you know, when we landed in Denver, and I seen you, and I said, I am totally blank. <laughs> I just, I just am totally blank because I do not. I remember her and her mother being there. What, when you came back from overseas? Came back from no. overseas in no. Denver that they no. picked me up there and brought me up here to, back to Loveland. But, uh, well, how did, uh, talk about how you, how you two met and how, uh, how you wooed her and, and the whole Oh, that, that's, a, that's an interesting story. We were, uh, of course, I was in Denver uh, training and Paul Ram, buddy of mine that was in my group, his folks happened to come up. So they took him up, he got a, a three-day pass and took him up to Estes Park. So Paul Ram comes back and he says, Daryl, you got to go with me. He said, there's a cabin up there. These girls working, you know, Trail Ridge up top, that's where they worked. And he said, there's eight girls in that cabin. He said, you've got to go. I said, well, let's do it. So next weekend, we go on up and uh, met all the girls, of course, and they decided, well, we'll have a picnic. So I choose the one girl, Dorothy was her name, and went to the picnic, come back from the picnic, and I said, well, let's go to the movie. She said, no, I don't want to go to the movie. So there was another girl, Margaret Cross, from Loveland here. So I asked Margaret, I said, uh, you going to move with me? She said, yeah. So her and I went to the movie. Come back from the movie, and I wasn't tired. And uh, I said, hey, is, I thought you girls said once about there was a dance hall around here that we could go to. And they said, yeah, there's a nice one. So I asked Dorothy and I asked Margaret, no, they didn't want to go. Well, somebody said there's a girl back in the back room sleeping back there. Go wake her up. He said, I think she'll go with you. So lo and behold, I went back and convinced her to get up and go with me. So her and I went to the dance. And from then on, here we are, 50 some years oh, later. Oh, be darned. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, so every chance you got a, 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 to get off base, you'd come up to see her? Or oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Every, every time I'd catch the bus. 
This kid's bus is in. It used to cost me uh, two dollars and fifty cents a night in the motel up here in Huffington. Wow. <laughs> and I don't think the bus. I don't think the bus was any more than that. Even even was that much. Wow. I don't think it was that much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, that's how we. That's how we met. And like I say, then I went to Korea, and then when I come back, then. And then you got when you came back, uh, you guys got married. Did she go then to Slida with you? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, she went to Slida with me. Okay. Now we've been going. I'm married here now for almost fifty-seven years. Wow. <laughs> and so was Slida your last? Uh, that, that's last where I was. Yeah. Dis just discharged there. Yeah. Well, I was going to tell you then about the KC. Oh, yeah, no, no, please do. Yeah. KC ninety sevens with the aerial fueling, so. I went back, I was interviewed at the base by a colonel, and he said, we'd like for you to go on KC-97s as an aerial refueler. Mm. I said, oh, I love that. Okay. So I come home, told her, she said, nope, if you're going back flying, I'm going home. She said, you've flown now for over three years, and she said, that's enough of flying for you. So I said, well, if you're going to do that, then I'll get out. Otherwise, I think I'd have stayed in the service. Oh, was that right? Made a career out of it? Yeah. <laughs> I loved the service. Yeah. I did. I loved it. <clears throat> I should, like I say, then we decided, decided to get out of the service and came back here to Loveland. And what did you take, uh, take your, your post-military life now and talk a little bit about what you did and family and, and we'll slowly wind down this interview then. Oh, when I get back here, I done just about anything I could find, because it was, when I got back, you know, we, a lot of the veterans talk about how tough it is to find a job, and uh, when I got back here, I, I remember I went down to the post office and applied, and uh, passed it, and told me, well, you don't qualify. I said, well, if I pass it, I must qualify, and they said, no, they're not in there for you, which they were hiring at that time, too. So, but I worked in construction then for uh, quite a while, and uh, I uh, drove a semi for three, four years or more. But I drove uh, semi for uh, which was clover uh, clover farms. Yeah, that I drove semi for. A bit, and then I went off from that. I went back in the construction. I worked that for a while, and then I went to work for HP. I believe it. Yeah, HP. I worked for, and worked for HP for fifteen years. Then hmm. went to took a manager's job down in Bainbridge, Georgia. Really? Yeah. You know, those people down there were 50, 75 years behind us. They really were. I only lasted down there 20 days and, and came back home. And uh, <clears throat> didn't, uh, trying to think, oh, I went back in the construction again. That's right, I went back in the construction again, worked there for a while, and went in a small engine repair, bought a lock shop, finally out and become a locksmith. It was that for 18 years. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what I sometimes, or what I did, uh, uh, even when I was with HP, is I joined the, well, you know, this was back in, when was the flood? 76? No, the, the first tornado that I went through here. Oh, oh. 65, I think it was. And, uh, of course, I knew the chief at that time, and I was walking down the street, and he said, get in the stop the patrol car, and he said, get in here. And I thought, oh, my goodness, what did I do? He said, I don't talk to you. So we went over to the police station, went in his office. He said, I want you as a reserve. I said, well, what is it? He said, be a reserve police officer. I said, well, that's exciting. So I've 11 years I've spent as a reserve. I was the first, or one of the, there was 10 of us. I was one of the first 10 that Loveland hired as a reserve. 
the reserve force at that time was bigger than the regular force. Is that right? Yeah. Oh yeah. We used to we used to go out and patrol, you know, at night by ourselves. And I, matter of fact, I think when I got on there in 1965, I think there was only about six or seven street officers. And today they got 115 or more. Yeah. 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 Well, it was a. Uh, did you have the same? Uh, responsibilities, or were you basically a full-blown officer, or was we it a vol volunteer type thing, or were no, you paid? We were, we were, no, we didn't get paid. We were just like a full, full, uh, blown police officer. We done everything, action investigations. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, huh. yeah, we done everything. Yeah, yep. It was it was interesting. Yeah, well, I done that eleven years. Hmm. And that, that's right, because after, right after that is when I bought out the locksmith business and uh, become a locksmith for 18 years. Is that where you retired from? That's where I retired from. Yeah. yeah. 1996. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk a little bit about family. You and Bernice have been married 57 years, you yep. said? Yep. And uh, Chogan, grandchildren, great grandchildren? Oh, yeah. yeah we got, uh, we had... Uh, Three children. We had a boy and two girls. We lost a little girl. Mm. It's back years and years ago now. And uh, now I got uh, nine, actually seven grandchildren. And one, two, three, four great grandkids now. Yeah, uh, four great grandkids. Hmm. Well, well, we'll start to wind down this interview, Daryl. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Uh, any other stories that have kind of floated to the top as we've been talking here? Uh, so that hopefully, ideally, we've rounded, captured your story as best we can, or, or do you think we, we did? I, I think we uh, pretty well. Okay. And, uh, my son, of course, is, has Vikut Funeral Home. Mm -hmm. David does. Mm -hmm. And my daughter he works up here at the uh, uh, therapy center. She works. Mm -hmm. Through the through the years that uh, you mentioned, you kept in touch with uh, people. Have, did you keep in touch with the guys you served with, or was there any sort of uh, reunions of any kind? Uh, yeah, that's, that's another one that's interesting. See, oh, good. This Carl Renner and I were really close. I mean, like I say, we went through our basic, we went through flight school, we went to Korea together. And of course, when we got out, Carl was originally from Ohio. And of course, I was originally from Wisconsin. And uh, uh, Don Davis was originally from California. So of course, when we got out of service, we all assumed that everybody went back to their state. Yeah. So, lo and behold, I get a, my granddaughter was here and she took the call. Uh, and the guy asked about, uh, is this Vigut? And she said, yes. And he asked, is Daryl? She said, yes, but he's not here. So I, uh, when I got back, of course, she gave me the number and I called it, and here it was Carl. He thought I went back to Wisconsin and I thought he went back to uh, to uh, Ohio and all these years he lived in Denver. Is that right? And that was 47 years later. later. Matter of fact, I just run across another one just here uh, that I had seen in, oh, clear back from Salina Day, came up here to attend a funeral service. And he looked at David, my son, and he said, uh, are you the Vikut that I think I'm thinking about? And David said, well, who are you talking about? And he said, Daryl. He said, David said, yeah, that's my dad. So I got, just got his telephone number here just the other day. So I got to call OCD and we're going to go down and, and uh, meet him. I'll be darned. Now, he was in Korea with us too, but he was in 
the 90th, which happens in the 13th bomb squadron. That, that's a question I forgot to ask you. So, 13th bomb squad, uh, which which air air force was it? The 15th? The no, the. Uh, See the what was it the third uh, third bomb wing third bomb wing third bomb wing yeah I got it's uh I think it's on here okay yeah we will dig that up then yeah okay. I think it's on there okay huh. but uh, it's so strange that we just and I told told Bernice I said we have to get down there to to see him and, and he's here in Colorado yeah well. he's in Denver yeah I got his address and everything yeah, I'll be darn yeah huh. well. One question I always like, a couple questions that I'll ask and then we'll, we'll end this interview. Uh, you know, a lot has been talked about the World War II, a lot has been talked about Vietnam, but the Korean War has been known as the Forgotten War. Forgotten war. What, what are your thoughts as a Korean War veteran? What are your thoughts about that? And, yeah, that's sad. That's a very sad thing. I was going to mention that when I came back and I couldn't find a job. I just took anything I could get. Because a lot of them would look at us and say, well, if you can't even say that you were in war because uh, that was just nothing but a police action. Well, you know that now, like I said, we in the aircraft and I, the poor ground people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my goodness, the stories that they had told us when we got in there, what those poor guys went through. Oh, see, the, the uh, Chinese and them were some of the most ruthless individuals. I mean, did you you surrender? And they would still go ahead and, and go ahead and put a bayonet through you or, or uh, decapitate you and, and uh, oh, they were, killing was nothing to them. Uh-uh. No. And this, this is what makes me so sick, you know, just like this young man in, in Washington. You know, I, I just can't imagine that man beat over there four times and be in his right mind. Yeah, yeah. Now, I got a I got a nephew that was a sniper, and he spent two groups in uh, two tours in Afghanistan, and he just flat told his mother. He said, I, "It's impossible for me to go back." Mm. He said, "I can." He'd go out in the field for six, eight weeks. Nobody knew where he was at. Mm. You know, his family did. Of course, they would send him out. You know, on, on these missions and that. But he'd be he'd be gone for six eight weeks at a time. Nobody would hear from him. Mm. Yeah, he he came back just well first of January, and he just like said he said, I can't I can't. He said it's there's no way I can do it. Mm. Wow. So, but that was the bad thing about the Korean was uh, you know it's no different than you know the stories I hear from Vietnam. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, or right now with the guys in Iraq and Afghanistan is that they there's nothing for them. And I, I think that's such a real sad thing of our government to go ahead and pick you and tell you yeah. you have to go over there, right. lose your good job that you had, and you come back you find out I haven't got nothing. Because of my pay and stuff, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't make your uh, house payments. I get a nephew. Another nephew that lost his whole thing because of his Vietnam service. Mm. Mm. You know, like today, it really, I get the laughing about it is the uh, pay. You know, when I went into Korea, my pay was thirty dollars a month. Thirty dollars a month. Thirty dollars a month, but I got a hundred dollars a month combat pay. And I was there, well, six months, and then I got a raise. I got thirty-two dollars a month. Wow, <laughs> that's all. That's all we got. Well, how how was it when once, uh, for example, once you were back in Salina and you had a wife? How did you survive on those wages? I mean, well, at that time with her allotment, her allotment and my pay together was one hundred and forty-nine dollars a month. Oh, jeez. But still, we went to, uh, we, I, th I think one month we counted it, we went to 22 movies, if I remember. But you know, you get in for a movie for a quarter. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, like, like, just before I got out, I bought a brand new Ford, brand new, 
eight hundred dollars. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Well, Daryl, the last question I always like to ask with these interviews: How do you think that period of time uh, in the Air Force, and particularly in in, in Korea and in, in combat? Played a role in your life, affected your life, changed your life at all, or did it, or was it just simply just a chapter of your life you went through? How would you answer that? No, I think it. I think it uh, really changes a person. I think it made me uh, the person I am today. Uh, my beliefs, and I tell you what, I'm more thankful for uh, for things. I think than what I ever was before. Because mm. before you just, you know, everything handed to you. And, and, but after you went through a bunch of this, then I think that you appreciate things. And, and uh, of course, I always had uh, uh, discipline. Yeah. Because being the farm boy and that, and, and my dad was very strong about that. Oh, I give a lot of thanks to my uh, parents. Yeah, I give a lot of thanks to them for... Mm -hmm. But like I said, I used to think after I went in, boy, what did I do? Just because I got, got mad at Dad. Because <laughs> I had to do the firework. I don't think it's right now. You know the old saying, what is that old saying? Uh, you never realize how fast your dad grew up. Oh, right, yeah. When, when, when you were 14, your parents were the stupidest people you ever knew. Right. It was amazing how smart they got. When you turned 21, it was amazing how smart they got when, in just seven years or something like that. I think Mark Twain, yeah. 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 I, said, I said, I realized that when I was in basic training. <laughs> but no, I think it's made me a lot better person. Yeah. I'm, I personally, I think that every, every kid should at least serve two years in service. Whether it's just stateside mm -hmm. or what, I think every person should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because you learn discipline then, and uh, you really learn what life is about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, very good. On that note, we'll uh, we'll end the interview. I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story, but uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you. Yeah. That's the uh, graduation picture from uh, basic training, San Antonio, Texas. That's the uh, graduation picture from uh, the gunnery school that when we got our wings. This is uh, the 13th Bomb Squadron emblem, which is the uh, oldest flying group in the Air Force today. Hmm. There I'm uh, with my flight gear on, waiting to go out on a flight. Here I am in the uh, gutter's compartment of the B-26. Now, uh, it looks cramped. I mean, were you comfortable enough? or You were cramped, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was tight, tight uh, quarters. I imagine I can't imagine sitting like that for four, it's up to four or five hours at a yeah. time. At uh, yeah. this is the uh, flight crew that we were getting ready to uh, go out on a flight. This here is the one airplane that we call the wheel. If you look on the tail, that's the wheel. And I took that from uh, our aircraft, was, which was on his uh, left. Now, and you would set uh, your, your situation? Right there. Okay. Right in here is where we set. Okay. This is uh, the flight of B-26s that's uh, in formation. And like you said earlier, you were, probably, you were one of the only few people that had a camera, so... You're the one that took all the pictures, yeah, huh? Yeah. yeah. Very good.